Ganz herzlich willkommen zu unserer äh, dritten Veranstaltung unserer Reihe Digitalisierung feministisch und dekolonial. Mein Name ist Francesca Schmidt. Ich habe diese Reihe konzipiert und darf sie euch heute gemeinsam mit meiner Co-Moderation, das ist heute Miriam Fahimi, durch diesen Arm führen. Bevor ich Kanter die Hall vorstelle, noch ganz kurz was zu Miriam und so ein paar Bemerkungen zum Ablauf und zum Housekeeping. Miriam Fahimi, meine Co-Moderation, ist Sozialwissenschaftlerin ähm, als Marie Curie Fellow am EU-Projekt No Bias, Artificial Intelligence Without Bias. Erforscht Miriam ethnografisch, wie Fairness in Entwicklungsprojekten von Algorithmen von unterschiedlichen AkteurInnen konzipiert und konstruiert wird. Miriam ist wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin im Digital Age Research Center der Universität Klagenfurt und promoviert dort in Science and Technology Studies. Ihre Forschungsinteressen äh, umfassen feministische und relationale Ansätze zur KI, Technologie und Infrastrukturen. Herzlich willkommen, Miriam. Ich freue mich, dass du heute mit mir hier am Start bist. Ich bin Referentin für intersektionales Änderungs- und Transformationswissen mit einem Schwerpunkt auf Digitalisierung in der Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung. Ähm, dem Bereich Digitalisierung aus einer intersektional-feministischen Perspektive, in dem bin ich schon sehr lange unterwegs. Und davor habe ich den Schwerpunkt feministische Netzpolitik, Digitalpolitik im Gunnar-Werner-Institut für Feminismus und Geschlechterdemokratie in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung aufgebaut. Das soll zu mir jetzt erstmal reichen. Ich will noch ganz kurz was zum ähm, Webinarformat sagen. Wir äh, sind heute hier zu, mehr oder weniger zu dritt äh, auf dem Podium. Ähm, Sie äh, hören gleich noch mal einen Vortrag äh, von Cantadia, der dauert so äh, 20 bis 30 Minuten und danach äh, können Sie gerne Fragen stellen. Sie können auch gerne Ihre Hand heben und hier aufs Podium kommen und hier Ihre Fragen stellen. Sie können das aber auch gerne schriftlich tun in der äh, Fragen- und Antworten-Sektion. Sie können das gerne auf Deutsch oder auf Englisch tun. Ähm, wir bringen das so, wie es ist, aufs Podium. Ähm, und Miriam wird die Fragen im Chat moderieren, auch Fragen, die sozusagen jetzt vielleicht äh, technischer Natur sind. Und dann diskutieren wir das hier. Ähm, genau, das vielleicht soweit zum Housekeeping. Housekeeping. Dann können wir jetzt zum inhaltlichen Teil vorkommen. Die Reihe Digitalisierung feministisch und dekolonial eröffnet machtkritische Perspektiven auf die digitale Transformation und Transformationsprozesse und fragt unter anderem nach deren Auswirkungen auf marginalisierte Communities. Wir möchten Digitalisierung als gesellschaftlichen Transformationsprozess verstehen, als solcher bedarf nicht nur technischer und finanzieller Ressourcen in der Umsetzung, sondern vielmehr ist auch das Wissen um eben solche Veränderungsprozesse notwendig. Und dieses Wissen ist in vielen Communities bereits vorhanden. Um Gesellschaft in ihrer Pluralität letztlich auch in diese Prozesse, also diese Transformationsprozesse einzubinden, sind machtkritische Perspektiven unabdingbar. Gesellschaft ist in der Regel durch Machtasymmetrien gekennzeichnet. In dieser Veranstaltungsreihe sollen also Expertinnen zur digitalen Transformation neue Perspektiven auf das Feld eröffnen. Und im Sinne einer dekolonialen Praxis wird es darum gehen, ähm, Wissen, was bisher an den Rändern verortet war, zu zentrieren. Und äh, äh, sozusagen auch äh, möchten wir auch diskutieren, wie äh, bisher marginalisierte Communities die digitale äh, Transformation mitgestalten können. Und heute ähm, wird es vor allem um die Vorstellung und Erzählung gehen, die wir von künstlicher Intelligenz haben. Seit Jahrtausenden und transkulturell hinweg haben Träume von intelligenten Maschinen unsere Hoffnungen, Ängste und Erwartungen an künstliche Intelligenz geprägt. Während KI ihr Potenzial als Technologie entfaltete und sich von ihrem Ursprung in Amerika der 1950er Jahre, über das man sicherlich noch mal diskutieren könnte, über den ganzen Globus ausbreitete, werden nicht westliche Perspektiven oft marginalisiert. Doch diese Erzählungen, Filme und Visionen sind von Bedeutung und gleich immer eng mit unterschiedlichen kulturellen Einstellungen gegenüber intelligenten Maschinen verbunden. Cantadia plädiert dafür, diesen marginalisierten Visionen von einer KI oder von KI einen Raum zu geben und die weiterhin hohe gesellschaftliche Relevanz anzuerkennen. Auch KI ist somit in koloniale Strukturen eingebunden. Denn die Art und Weise, wie künstliche Intelligenz dargestellt wird, trägt eben jene kolonialen Strukturen in sich. Egal ob Roboter, SprachassistentInnen oder Filme, reale und fiktionale Darstellungen von künstlicher Intelligenz haben in der Regel weise Merkmale. Ich zitiere, die Geschichte rund um künstliche Intelligenz sind Zukunftsvorstellungen, in denen es kaum People of Color gibt. Es gibt weiße Menschen, um die sich Roboter kümmern, die durch Akzente und Gesichtszüge ethnisch weiß erscheinen. So kannte die Hall in einem Interview. 
Ähm, sie ist Dozentin für Wissenschaftskommunikation am Imperial College London und Associate Fellow der Leverhulme Center for Future of Intelligence an der Universität Cambridge. In ihrer Forschung konzentriert sie sich auf die Geschichten, die wir, uns, die wir in verschiedenen Kulturen über Wissenschaft und Technologie erzählen und darauf, wie sie uns helfen, über Ethik und Bias bei neuen Technologien nachzudenken. Kanta war außerdem Principal Investigator des Projekts Global AI Narratives. Das ist äh, von 2018 bis 2022 gelaufen. Und in dem hat sie das interkulturelle öffentliche Verständnis von künstlicher Intelligenz untersucht, wie es durch fiktionale und nicht fiktionale Erzählungen konstruiert wird. Kantas Arbeit überschneidet sich mit den Bereichen Wissenschaftskommunikation, Literatur und Wissenschaft sowie Science Fiction. Und jetzt bin ich tatsächlich sehr gespannt auf den Vortrag von Kanta dir. Und übergebe dir, liebe Kanta, das Wort. Thank you, Francesca. I'll just go and uh, share my screen, um, show you some pictures. Um, let's see. Uh, is that working? Can I have a thumbs up from Francesca Miriam? Okay, brilliant. Um, so um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here this evening. Um, so particularly, Francesca, for uh, arranging the whole lecture series and everything behind the scenes. And a special thanks to um, Anne and Ines, my interpreters uh, this evening. Um, es ist wirklich am besten, dass ich das alles auf Englisch sagen darf. Um, so I have been very generously introduced by uh, Francesca. Um, I should just add uh, that since 2017, I've been working with Stephen Cave of the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence at Cambridge on a, a series of projects uh, on the stories we tell about AI and where they come from. And so it's that work that informs my talk today and all of that research we have done together. So from what I understand, next week in this lecture series. Richtig verstanden habe, geht es nächste Woche in dieser Veranstaltungsreihe um touching upon things like bias data sets or the exploitation of click workers who train AI in the global south or such topics. And instead, I'll go back to one of the roots of these problems, the stories we tell about these technologies, which influence what people want and expect from the technology. So I'll show you some of the problems with the most popular stories about AI, how they link back to Western colonialism, and what kind of alternative stories we've identified around the world. So we started in 2017 by investigating stories about AI in the Western world, and especially North America, where both the technology and the most well-known stories come from. So that work turned into the book AI Narratives, shown here on the slide on the left. And in that book, we explain what these most influential narratives look like and how they stereotype the technology and the people who build it and the people who are affected by it. So we showed that there are some serious problems with the ways in which the Western world talks about AI. So first, we looked at stereotypes about artificial intelligence itself. AI is often imagined as looking like a human, doing human jobs, such as a servant or a soldier. But AIs also go beyond jobs and um, involve themselves in roles within human social structures and relationships. So for example, artificial sexual companions have been imagined for literally millennia. So those are the stereotypes about the product, the AI itself. But these kinds of stories also uh, perpetuate and uh, make worse the stereotypes and expectations about the creator, so the AI developer or engineer. So in this image, it's not hard to guess which of the two is supposed to be the developer and which the AI. And this is a still from the TV series Westworld. So what we saw in the AI narratives project is that AI, at least in the West, is first of all, literally the product of the white male imagination. And by this, we mean that the great majority of the people who have created these dominant ideas about AI are English speaking white men. But also 
in those stories, white men create white robots. So even in our imagination, AI is a product of the white male imagination. Two layers to this. And when we realized that, kind of how deep it goes, we wrote two papers about it, um, the whiteness of AI and race and AI. And we looked at why it seems to be the case that an intelligent machine seems to so often be imagined as white, both in color, literally white, and in ethnicity, ethnically white. So my examples on the previous slide were from film and TV, but we found the same thing in real humanoid robots, uh, chatbots and virtual assistants, and stock images. And we think there are three possible explanations for this whiteness. First, the normalization of whiteness in the West. Second, the extent to which AI makes it possible to imagine a white utopia without any people of color. And third, the association of intelligence with the ideal white Western man. So normalization of whiteness in the West is a bit of a mouthful, but we mean essentially the first argument that people tend to come up with when we point out that so much AI is white. So this argument, oh, AIs are just white because white people are the majority in the countries where these ideas come from. So because whiteness is so normal and standard in Western culture, uh, culture uh, many people don't notice that these machines, when they become human-like, become racialized as white. They just see them as becoming human-like, not a specific kind of human. So it's um, it's not unexpected that we see loads of um, white intelligent machines as a default that people don't think about. Okay, fair enough. But it's not a sufficient explanation in its own right, because not all intelligent humanoid beings imagined by predominantly white industries and uh, creative people are portrayed as white. Aliens have been stereotyped in all kinds of ways as West Indian, Jewish, East Asian, and those too are intelligent, human-like, but not human entities. So what makes AI different? Now, the next thing we thought about was that the whiteness of these machines allows for a white utopian imagined future that completely excludes people of color. So back to the overview of why is AI white? One of the most pertinent, the most widespread hopes for artificial intelligence is that it will give us a life of ease and happy, uh, toil-free leisure. So relieving the owners of AI of unwanted labor. And uh, critical race theorists very frequently point out that the leisure that is available to wealthier people today is disproportionately supported by the labor of working class people of color and particularly women of color. But even that relationship, that sort of minimal but necessary presence of people of color seems undesirable to the white people in power. And um, I recommend you read the works of Bell Hooks uh, on this topic. She has written very eloquently on this. So there is a long literary history of utopias that are constructed on exclusionary colonialist and eugenicist premises. And um, in, uh, the idea that you can have your uh, people of color who work as servants to um, produce this uh, ease and labor-free future and replace them with white machines makes the idea um, a more attractive utopia to some. Now, thirdly, we argued that AI is probably um, depicted as white so often because it's considered to possess attributes that um, are associated by white people with white people. Um, 
and particularly the attributes of intelligence, professionalism, and power. Um, so uh, by now you might be wondering, okay, so, so how exactly does this link to the issue of decolonizing AI narratives? So it is in these attributes that you can really link the whiteness of AI to issues of Western colonization. And particularly when you look at um, the attribute of intelligence, really the intelligence part of artificial intelligence. Because the European colonial project partly legitimized itself through the idea that white European men were more intelligent than everyone else. So especially throughout the 19th century, um, throughout Europe, you saw all these efforts being made to empirically demonstrate and measure and prove this intellectual difference. So tests such as the IQ test um, and in the US, the uh, SAT, the university admissions test were uh, created in order to prove the uh, hypothesis that they had that white people were more intelligent than everyone else. And now, of course, explicit associations between racial groups and intelligence sharply declined after the Second World War. Um, these kind of associations continue to be made in right wing circle and um, implicit and unconscious associations between race and intelligence persist really very widely beyond those right wing circles. Um, and we have also seen in recent years that um, quite explicit associations between race and intelligence are being made by some um, some influential voices in the uh, in the AI space. So there is a centuries long association of intelligence with the white European male. And that makes it not unexpected that when this culture is asked to imagine an intelligent machine, it imagines a white machine. And of course, with machines becoming more intelligent, um, much of the current discourse around AI focuses on how it is or it will soon be capable of professional work. And in that sense, AI is often contrasted with previous waves of automation in which machines performed uh, manual or semi-skilled labor. So intelligent machines doing professional work, law, medicine, business, and those are professions with long histories of excluding people of color. And another much hyped narrative is that AIs will rise up and conquer us altogether, you know, the um, AI apocalypse scenario. Those are narratives about machines becoming superior to humans. But those who imagine being overtaken by superior beings don't imagine them resembling peoples who they have long framed as inferior, as less intelligence. Instead, they imagine them as superlatives, as super versions of themselves. So hyper-masculine white men like Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator, or hyper-feminine white women like Alicia Vikander as Ava in Ex Machina. And that's why even narratives of an AI uprising that are clearly modeled on stories of slave rebellions have such a tendency to show the rebellious AIs as white people. So for example, in the film Blade Runner. And looking at those aspects of the whiteness of AI reveals also a different perspective on the ways in which people have been hierarchized throughout history. So AI, and particularly the ever on the horizon AGI, artificial general intelligence, is being uh, uh, associated with traits that have historically been denied in the Western world to people of color and other minorities. Um, this kind of status, the ideas of uh, being, um, you know, as intelligent as, uh, or capable of being the most intelligent, capable of being 
scientists capable of uh, doing the professions uh, to um, uh, to the best way possible. Um, so the ways in which many people seem to think about AI reveals how prevalent those stereotypes and assumed hierarchies uh, still are. Um, it, essentially, when you, when you bring AI into the conversation, it shows that the people in charge of creating the technology and the narratives around it are more likely to attribute traits such as intelligence, but also um, personhood and trustworthiness to a machine than to people of marginalized identities. And we have been arguing that this process of biasing and stereotyping um, creates a vicious cycle. When the narratives perpetuate stereotypes, this affects the culture of the industry itself and who is able to work in it. So having a homogenous group of developers means that the technology will have biases that aren't picked up on early enough. And that leads to inequalities in society. And that again becomes uh, reflected in new narratives. So uh, a vicious cycle of injustice um, that is at work here in uh, depictions of artificial intelligence but are there alternatives to these stories and is that inevitable that we imagine intelligent machines this way um, so the western and particularly the english speaking tradition was our starting place because it is arguably disproportionately influential in many parts of the world but Although much AI technology is developed in Silicon Valley and much AI storytelling is done in Hollywood, California is not the only place to ever have imagined the existence of intelligent machines. And so we found that comparative research was needed looking at different religious, linguistic, philosophical, literary and cinematic traditions to make us better understand you know, those uh, those of us located in the West, our own narratives, and look for alternatives. And so our next research project called Global AI Narratives focused on that. Um, so we wanted to find out what stories are being told in the margins of the dominant cultures, and what stories are being told where other cultures are dominant. And so to do that, Global AI Narratives convened a series of 20 workshops around the world, as Francesca said, between 2018 and 2022. Uh, we started off with in-person ones, and then, of course, COVID happened and we moved to a hybrid format. But that did mean that we were able to represent all seven continents in these workshops. And um, the uh, other book on this previous slide, Imagining AI, collects uh, some of those insights. And uh, we did see uh, all over the world um, these very close links between politics, international and local politics, and the ways in which AI is imagined. So I'll give uh, three examples of narratives that explicitly aim to reject colonialist views of the technology, decolonial AI. And that is a theme that very frequently emerges in narratives about AI, both in the global south and among marginalized populations in the global north. So I'll show three kinds of responses to neo-colonial dominance in the field of AI, absence, resistance, and reimagining. So first on absence, um, our work, whoop, I, I am sorry that just disappeared. Um, let me just put that back up. Um, is that coming through again? Hmm. Yes, no, it's coming yes. through again. Okay, great. Now let me just find the right slide again. Um, there we go. So sorry. Um, so uh, on, on absence, our uh, work in the Middle East and North Africa, about which we um, co-authored the report um, on the slide here, um, very strongly focused 
on the post-colonial and neo-colonial aspects of AI technologies and uh, perceptions of how people see AI and um, uh, what they think about a future with AI um, in the Middle East and North Africa. So many local contributors claimed that uh, Egypt in particular was what they called an AI desert, that there is no development of AI technology ongoing in Egypt, nor are there any films or literature or non-fiction works stemming from the region that portray a future with intelligent machines. So there was a very strong sense that both science and fiction are being imposed from outside, from the West and from Japan in particular. But um, that is not the only way of looking at this region. And we did at the same time see um, immediate pushback against uh, this idea of the AI desert in the sense that a desert is not empty and lifeless. And contributors from other parts of the region showed that particularly on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, nations are developing their own hybrid of Western technologies and stories um, with local approaches. So one example is the uh, Ibn Sina robot uh, pictured here, which speaks Arabic. And um, this leads to a, a difficult situation where um, not everyone is equally happy with that hybrid, as some call this move self-orientalism, using Western technologies with aspects that the West would consider typically Middle Eastern. So a robot wearing a toba and a kufiya, or science fiction stories that feature jinns alongside AI, for example. So that is absence and uh, some of the um, uh, ways in which people are trying to push back against or um, uh, fill that absence. The second response is resistance, for which I'll now take us to Brazil. So. As our contributor to Imagining AI, Edward King, has pointed out, in Brazil, social media is a very double-edged sword. Um, on the one hand, as we know from around the world, including us here, its algorithms drive up and encourage the clustering of like-minded people. And that includes the clustering and encouraging of racists and other spreaders of hate speech. But on the other hand, in Brazil, it's become a platform for resistance. And artists do that by using the aesthetics of Afrofuturism, uh, which is a movement that focuses on the experiences and the concerns of people in the African diaspora uh, through technology, through culture, and through science fiction. And so a huge range of Black Brazilian artists are using technology to create new ways of imagining a future in which they, for a change, are in charge of rather than victims of technology. So one example is here on the slide, a still from the 2020 uh, video Ilisao by the artist Victoria Cribb. And then the third response uh, that we've come across is to reimagine AI. So thinking about what AI might look like in the future if we don't follow the dominant narratives and predictions and technologies. So um, three years ago, a group of indigenous scholars, artists, and thinkers from indigenous communities all over the world started a conversation on how to center and engage indigenous voices in the future development of artificial intelligence. Um, one of their approaches, in the words of uh, the scholar Jason Edward Lewis, was to imagine AI as a helper, trying to find the middle ground between um, the Hollywood stories of um, Blade Runner, where AI is a slave, and the Terminator, where AI is a tyrant, and instead finding a way to think about AI and humans being in what he calls reciprocal relationships of care and support. Um, and I really recommend uh, you to check out the amazing position paper called Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence, um, where uh, this group offers a series of, of vignettes of short 
stories and um, other creative expressions that show what this might look like. So they think about a multi-sensory computing device based on the traditional bags of the Algonquin people from what is now Eastern Kalina, um, or a poem about a child raised by three AIs developed from Hawaiian and Blackfoot values, which is illustrated on the slide. So as you can see, um, again, this is also breaking out of the idea that AI needs to look like humans. So I want to finish with a brief reflection on the term decolonizing, because the term decolonizing has become much debated. It's become a bit of a buzzword to just mean diversity or something like that. And that's not representative of what decolonizing is supposed to do. So as um, scholars have frequently stated, it's not a metaphor. It is about constantly trying to unsettle and question the status quo. So I'd recommend everyone to, for example, read Rachel Adams' um, excellent paper, Can AI Be Decolonized? Um, in that she very eloquently makes the point that decolonization has to include work in the places that institutionalize co colonial oppression, such as the universities I work at, Imperial College London, what's in the name, and the University of Cambridge. Uh, so here I work on decolonizing the mindset, dismantling the ideology, and dis deconstructing the thinking that has led to imperialism and colonial oppression in the first place. And one way to do that is to demonstrate that intelligent machines don't have to be the master's tools, don't have to be the tools that lead to the white utopia. They have been dreamt of across the world in very different and more constructive ways, and we can learn a lot from all that. Thank you for listening. Ich möchte mich ganz herzlich bei dir bedanken, Kanta, für diese äh, sehr zahlreichen und wirklich, äh, ich, ja, für mich jetzt heute mal mindblowing ein Einblicke in das Thema. Das äh, wird mich weiter dahin treiben. Ich freue mich sehr, dass du da warst. Ich hoffe, wir bleiben in Verbindung und ich äh, wünsche dir noch einen ganz tollen Abend. Thank you so much for having me. Und an alle anderen, bevor äh, Sie hinaus entschwinden in den Abend, noch der Hinweis, in der nächsten Woche Mittwoch äh, spreche ich oder wir mit Paola Ricorte und da geht es um die Dekolonisierung von Daten. Also im Grunde genommen das, was wir brauchen, um ähm, und vielleicht dann nach andere äh, künstliche Intelligenzen zu bauen äh, und uns andere Zukünfte damit vorzustellen, sollten sie denn technologischer Art sein. Ich bedanke mich auch bei Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit und wünsche auch Ihnen noch einen schönen Abend.